Before we get into the message, we wanted to say a special hello to our extended family around the world and also say thank you for joining us. Whether you're watching from our River of Life app, Facebook, or YouTube channels, we are so thankful to be connected with you. Uh, the series is about carnal Christians, carnal Christians. So if you know a little bit of Spanish or you've been to a Mexican restaurant or a, or a South American restaurant of some, one of the countries in South America or Central America that has uh, their uh, distinctive cuisine, then you, uh, or if you've been to Taco Bell, then you can say carne asada. And uh, so... Uh, uh, in, in Spanish, in Portuguese, my wife and I speak Portuguese, carne is, is meat, and it's flesh. And uh, so there's this phenomenon that all of us have seen, and all of us have experienced it to some degree ourselves, where we're Christians, but uh, we've behaved and we have thought in a fleshly manner, in a manner that is not spiritually minded. It's not in accordance with the Word of God. It's not in accordance with what pleases God or is God's will for our lives. It's actually part of what the Bible refers to as the old man. And the Bible says that that old man was crucified with Christ on the cross. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we have this situation where we are genuinely saved in the sense that we have put our faith and our trust in Christ and we have been born again. And we, our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and we have the assurance of salvation and the assurance that the Lord has gone ahead of us to prepare a place for us and that uh, we're, we're headed for heaven, but we're still alive. And we discover, as the Apostle Paul writes in Romans, that there are two things operating. There's this spiritual man, and then there's this old man, this fleshly man, carnal man, that wants to dominate. And these two are in opposition to one another. He writes about this in Galatians chapter 5, where he says the deeds of the flesh are these, and, and those who walk in the Spirit, they're going to do these things, and these things are diametrically opposed to one another, and there's no compromise, there's no middle ground. One is either going to win and the other one's going to lose, or, or they're never going to make a truce, and they have nothing in common with one another. In other words, the, the, the sinful nature, the old man, the carnal part of us, uh, and it's not your physical body. God doesn't hate your body. It's not your body is not the problem. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. So the, 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 the dualist or the Gnostic says that your body is, is doomed to be that way. Jesus did not come to redeem your flesh. He just came to make your spirit born again. So your flesh is always going to be your flesh. And that's okay because grace will cover your flesh and God will not look at it, and he won't notice what you do and how you act or what you say or what your attitudes are. He's just going to notice that you're in Christ. And you're, but the Bible says that, that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, and those old things, carnal stuff, passes away, and, and things become new. So we begin to operate in newness. So this carnal phenomenon, and it's almost like uh, we live in a two-story house, and there's the upper story which uh, we're in right now because we're here in church and we're in the upper story. We went upstairs because it's Sunday. So we climb the stairs and we go up to meet God on Sunday and we stay up there in the upper room to meet the Lord in the second floor. And then we come down as soon as, sometimes we don't even wait till we leave the parking lot before we come running down the steps and now we're back on the first floor again. And we live on the first floor all week long until Sunday comes. And if you're the average Christian today, who says they're a Christian, and you're the average carnal Christian, you come, you go upstairs 1.7 times a month. So you don't even go up every Sunday. And, and forget about Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday. Wednesdays, that's hump day. You know, that's, that's when we go out to somewhere and, you know, <laughs> the middle of the week, we got to have some, you know, refreshments and fortification to get through the rest of the week. That's our night. Forget about Wednesday night church. So 1.7 times a month. So carnal Christians. So there are Christians who literally are one and done. Like I'm saved. 
I'm done. I went to the altar, I'm done. I went to church for a while, read my Bible some, took a couple of discipleship classes, never really followed through, I'm one and done. And there are people who sit in churches, and I've seen this, I've been frustrated by it, but I've seen this, they don't change at all. They live on the first floor, and even on Sunday. They're just, there is no budge in these folks. They're just stuck. You can't even talk to them. I, I, I know people who, because they were baptized as an infant, feel like they've got their ticket to heaven because I'm baptized. I was baptized in the church. Infant baptism. I grew up in a denomination, and I was in it, you know, my, historically that was my family's line of religion, and they baptized babies. And, and that was a big deal. And once you were baptized, you were, that was it. You were, you were kind of in. So then to try to talk a person into moving on with God and going onward and upward with God is almost impossible because they just look at you and say, I don't even hear you because I already got it. I'm one and done. I'm done. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. That's it. This is as far as I'm going until I die. And then I'm going to heaven. That's what people believe. This is it. This is as far as I'm going to go with God until I die and he takes me to heaven. Now, you back that up for me with scripture if you can. You show me in the Bible where you can be one and done. You show me in the Bible where you can do this one little thing and then you just wait till you die and in between, you just do what you want and your ticket to heaven is guaranteed and you have pleased God and honored Christ and demonstrated the power of God and the power of God's grace, and been a witness for Christ, and live for God so that other people will want to know Jesus just like you know Jesus. Let me read some scripture to you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 20 through 23. This is Moses. Brought the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And now they're headed, supposedly, to the promised land. They've passed through the Red Sea, but there's still one more body of water that they have to cross, and they have to cross the Jordan. So we're kind of taught, I mean, get this picture now. The one and done folks are the Red Sea people. The folks who continue on are the ones who make it to the banks of the Jordan. And they don't stop there, they go across. What's on the other side of the Jordan? What is on the other side of the Jordan? The promised land. Some of you are looking at me like a cow at a new gate. <laughs> What's on the other side of the Jordan? The other side of the Jordan, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. How do you expect me to know? I'm just a carnal Christian. I don't read my Bible. You do that for me. The other side of the Jordan is the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, a place of rest. So here's what he says. When your sons ask you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. So say this with me. He brought us out to bring us in. Personalize it with the personal pronoun. He brought me out to bring you in, to bring me in. He brought me out to bring me in. So if you claim to be out, then why did you stop? Because he didn't just bring you out to bring you out. He brought you out to bring you in. Amen? This is what you explain to your children. When our children say, Mom and Dad, why do you go to church? Why do you tithe? Why do you seek God? Why do you love God? 
Why do you live differently than other people live? You're not like my friend's parents. We're not like the, the kids that I, that, I, that I go to school with or the, the kids that live on our street. We do things that other people don't do. Why do we do the things that we do? Then you explain to them the reason that we do these things is because we love God so much, because we were slaves and dead in our trespasses and sins. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, God brought us out and he brought us out and now we're going in. We live our lives going in. We're going in. We're not all the way in yet. The apostle Paul said, I'm not all the way in yet. I haven't reached that place yet, but I'm pressing on and I'm headed in that direction. And if you want to know where I'm going, I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm going into all that God has for me. I'm going into all that he's promised me. I'm going into the promised land. And the only reason that I can even say that is because he brought me out. And I, I, I was helpless. I was oppressed. I was bound. I, I had no future. I had no hope. I was, I was, I was persecuted and, and, and I was powerless. And God had mercy on my soul and God brought me out with a mighty deliverance. And because he brought me out, I'm going to live the rest of my life going in, drawing near to him, getting closer to him. So this is how you talk to your kids. This is what you teach them. This is what you explain to them. Maybe you want to tell them just enough of your testimony, depending on how old they are, for them, them to understand what bondage really looks like. Maybe you want to talk to them a little bit about what it feels like to be bound and to be dead and lost in your sins. And you want to tell them how hopeless you were and how helpless you were and how miserable your life was and how you felt and, and what you thought and, 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 and the change that has been made now since God has brought you out of that and how you see things differently now than you ever did before. But some wouldn't go in. See, did they all go in? No, they didn't all go in, did they? He brought them out to bring, he brought all of them out, didn't he? And he wanted to bring all of them in, didn't he? But, but not all of them did go in. And so this is what the Bible says. This is why the Holy Spirit says, if only you would listen to his voice this day, don't make him angry by hardening your hearts like your ancestors did during the days of their rebellion when they were tested in the wilderness. There your fathers, this is the Lord speaking now, there your fathers tested me and tried my patience. Even though they saw my miracles for 40 years, they still doubted me. This ignited my anger with that generation. And I said to them, they wander in their hearts just like they do with their feet and they refuse to learn my ways. My heart grieved over them. So I decreed they will never enter into the calming rest of my spirit. So search your hearts every day, my brothers and sisters, and make sure that none of you has evil or unbelief hiding within you, for it will lead you astray and make you unresponsive to the living God. This is the time to encourage each other to never be stubborn or hardened by sin's deceitfulness, for we are mingled with the Messiah if we will continue unshaken in this confident assurance from beginning until the end. The same people who were delivered from bondage and brought out of Egypt by Moses were the ones who heard and still rebelled. They grieved God for 40 years by sinning in their unbelief until they dropped dead in the desert. So God swore an oath that they would never enter into his calming place of rest, all because they disobeyed him. It is clear that they could not enter into their inheritance because they wrapped their hearts in unbelief. But the Bible says there remains that place of rest. It is still available. They didn't choose to enter into it, but it's still available to us. God did not close off the way. God is still determined to bring those that he brought out in. God is determined to see you in. Not where you are now, but where he's designed for you to be. He wants to bring you in to that place of rest and peace the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And sometimes we say, Lord, where is that? But it isn't in the desert. So if you're living in the desert and you refuse to cross over, if you're one and done, the joy, the peace, the rest, it ain't happening. It's not happening. The first step was a huge success. Maybe you had a glorious first step. Your salvation experience when you came to Christ was awesome. It was fantastic. You're still remembering it. You still live off of that. And that's your memory. And you don't have any news. You don't have any new things. You don't have any, any latelys. You don't have any up-to-dates. 
You just have, 20 years ago, I walked the aisle, and uh, 20 years ago in a revival meeting, this happened to me and that happened to me, and it was a glorious first step. For the children of Israel, it was a really glorious first step. Signs, wonders, miracles, God brought them out with a mighty hand. They didn't fight the Egyptians. God fought the Egyptians. God defeated the Egyptians. God brought them out. God did it. God did it. You didn't save yourself. You didn't, uh, you didn't deliver yourself. You didn't cleanse yourself. God did it. Did it all by himself. He did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. God did it. It was glorious. It was spectacular. The cross is what we celebrate and what we preach. An awesome sign and a wonder of God's power and God's mercy and God's grace. That's why the Bible tells us that, that the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the cross. I determined to know nothing among you except the cross, the power of the cross. Christ crucified, dead, buried, raised again. Pharaoh's the type of the devil. He just defeated the devil, slapped his teeth out, tore up all of the accusations and all of the indictments against you for all the many sins that you committed, tore up, tore up all the writs and all the uh, warrants for arrest, tore it all up and said, you're free. God did all of that. The first step was awesome. The second step for these people was a total failure. Were the people free once they were brought out? They were still in the wilderness, but were they free? They were free, weren't they? Pharaoh, Pharaoh pursued them, but God took care of that too, didn't he? He said, no, I'm going to try to recapture you. It wasn't successful. They wondered if they were free when they saw the dust of Pharaoh's chariots, and they thought, well, he's coming again. We're really not free. We got our hopes up. It was a false hope. Here we go again. We're going to go back into bondage, and God stepped in, and he intervened, and he took care of it. They were truly free. Pharaoh didn't think so. Pharaoh thought he still had a claim to them, but God said, no, they're mine now. God looks at you and he says, no, they're mine now. She's mine. He's mine. The devil rises up and says, I'm going to snatch her back into bondage. No, you're not. She's mine. She's free. That's God's perspective on his people. Pharaoh's a type of the devil and he held him in bondage, but he was de defeated by the power of God. The blood of an innocent lamb was shed to bring about a great deliverance from death. And all this was by grace through faith. And that's how we made that first step, by grace through faith. The wilderness, though, is where the sins of the people were put on full display after they were delivered from Egypt. You read about how they suffered before and how they cried out to God and you have pity on them and you say, oh God, these poor people. Oh, these poor people. Look at them. They're, they're, they're in bondage. Look at what Pharaoh's doing to them. Oh, they're these poor, helpless people. Oh God, you got to do something about them. And, and, and God did. We think that these people are poor, helpless victims, don't we? Which, oh, they're victims. Oh, they got no control over anything and they're, and, and they're, they're so cruelly oppressed and they're, they're treated so, so badly. God, you got to do something. These people are victims. They're good people. They're good people. It's a bad Pharaoh. Pharaoh's bad. Israel's good. Was Israel good? How long did it take for everybody's eyes to be opened and see just how good Israel was as soon as they crossed the Red Sea, as soon as they got out into the wilderness? How good were they? They weren't good at all. Moses was so disgusted with them that he said, God, kill me. I don't want to be around these people anymore. They're rebellious. They're stiff-necked. I did all of this stuff, and now I brought them out, and this is what I get? I get this bunch? This is my congregation? I got them saved from Pharaoh, and now I got to deal with all of this murmuring and grumbling and complaining? All this wickedness? All this, this uh, immorality? I got to deal with all this, all this horrible stuff. They want to kill me. They want to stone me. These people are evil. They deserve to go back to Egypt and be put under Pharaoh again. And God said, no, I brought them out to bring them in. But their sins were put on full display. Isn't it interesting how when we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we're not sensitive to sin? Isn't it interesting that as soon as we come to Christ, we come face to face with ourselves and see that we're carnal. We are fleshly. We got stuff. We have desires. We have bad habits. We got bad attitudes. We've got stuff that's entrenched in us, stuff that's rooted in us. We don't even know where it came from. It just comes out. It just comes out. I'm supposed to be a Christian now. I'm supposed to be free now, but this stuff just keeps coming out. And God allowed them to see what was really inside of them. So they were in a free position, but struggling internally with a sin condition. So positionally, you're free. But internally... Your condition is not so good. 
It wasn't good at all, and, and they couldn't see it as long as they were in bondage in Egypt. They just didn't see who they really were. It wasn't until they got out and they were free to really be themselves, to really make their own choices and make up their own mind that we begin to see what their will looks like and what they choose once they're free to choose. And what did they choose? Idolatry, rebellion, immorality, Everything wicked and evil that they could choose, that's what they chose. So when you get saved and you think that you're one and done, then you wake up the next day and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I feel, I just blew up at somebody. I just, I just cussed somebody out yesterday. But I was at the altar on Sunday. Then people start thinking, well, maybe I'm not saved. Oh, you're you're out, but you're just not in yet. God brought you out. And now when you are face to face with your flesh, for heaven's sake, don't stop. What happened to the people when they decided to stop? They said, no, we're not going in. They hated the wilderness, didn't they? Don't you hate the wilderness? People cry all the time. Pray all the time. Oh, God, just, I'm, I want to be, I can't, I keep doing this, and I keep messing up over here, and I keep, I hate it. I feel like I'm living, I'm not anywhere. I'm not, I'm not where I was, but I'm not where I, I'm supposed to be. I'm in this place here that's just the wilderness. You're taking care of me. I mean, you're providing for me. You're, you're giving me grace. God was gracious to them when they were in this condition, wasn't he? He's not going to kill you while you're in between. How are you going to get in if he kills you when you're in the middle? He sees all this stuff. He knows it's all there. You're the one that doesn't know. I'm the one that doesn't know. God reveals all of these things. Why? So we'll run back to Egypt and say it wasn't real? Of course it was real. Of course I'm saved. Of course I'm out of bondage. What I'm dealing with now is carnality. I'm dealing with the old man. I'm trying to hurry with this. So you understand where we're coming from. You hate that. I hate it when I do that. I just screamed at my kids. I just, just cussed at my wife. I... Ah, I hate myself when I do that. I hate it. I just, I just did something I know I shouldn't do. Christians aren't supposed to do that, but I just keep doing it. Just keep going back to this and keep going back to that and keep stumbling over the same things. feel like I'm going around and around and around the same mountains. I'm wandering. I'm just like I'm lost in the wilderness. When we get in that position, what did the people do? They lost sight of the promised land, didn't they? But they hated the wilderness. They wished that they were somewhere else. Constantly saying, oh, I mean, this is, this is so miserable. I, you know, it would almost be better to just go back to Egypt. Just be lost again. And I went to worry about it. I mean, I just, I'm lost, just be lost. But God brought them out. So they're out. And, and you can't stay in the wilderness forever. You hate the wilderness. But what were they afraid of? When they had an opportunity to see what was in front of them, what did they see? They saw the giants. When you look at entering into the promised land and entering into the rest and the peace and the holiness and the, and the sanctification and the freedom that God has for you, what immediately rises up in front of you? For some of the men, it's pornography. The giant, there it is. You're never going to beat it. It's going to drag you down. It's going to, and we're so afraid of it. We're afraid to talk about it. We're afraid to tell anybody about it. We're afraid to confront it, afraid to deal with it. Fear, fear of the giant. Fear of the giant. With other people, it's greed. They just, I can't, I can't go on with God. I can't enter in because uh, I'm never going to tithe. Can't do that. Can't give, I can't give the church my money. I can't do it. I'm not giving my money to that guy. I don't know what he's going to do with it. I'm not giving it to him. And the giant of mammon, that's what the money thing is called in the Bible. Mammon. It's got a name. Doesn't sound good, does it? Mammon rises up and says, if you do that, if you cross over, then everything you have belongs to God. Then you're not the owner of anything anymore, but now you're just a steward of what he's given to you, and you have to do whatever he tells you with your money. Oh, I can't do that. I hate living here in the wilderness. I hate not being able to pay my bills. 
I hate not being blessed financially. I hate it. I hate it always in a financial embarrassment. Always ashamed and humiliated because I can't pay my bills. Hate the wilderness. But then God says, if you'll just go in and face the giant, I'm going to give you victory. I'm afraid to do that. I'm afraid. I got to hold on to my money. Hold on to my stuff. Got to hold on to that. So the fear of the giants kept them in the wilderness. And you know, you know who they blamed for their suffering and their misery? Moses. Wanted to stone him, kill him. Every time they turn around, it's the preacher's fault. It's his fault. It's the church's fault. It's God's fault. Got to blame somebody for the mess that you're in. Got to blame somebody for the misery that you're feeling. God, if you loved me, you'd... God says, I love you. I loved you and brought you out. And I'm committed to bringing you in. If you weren't so stiff-necked and hard-hearted and willful, I'll bring you in. Me bringing you in and you being in the wilderness has nothing to do with the level of love that I have for you. I demonstrated my love for you and my son died on the cross for you. Do not talk to me about love. Oh, if you love me, you'd, oh, if God loved me, but of course God loves you. It's not what God loves, it's what you love is the problem. Come on now. Aren't you glad I'm not God? But what does the Bible say? He gets fired up about this stuff. He's more fired up about it than I am. Everything God feels, he feels on a God level. You think you get angry? Oh, God gets angry on a God level. You think you love people? God loves people on a God level. It's all bigger. It's bigger. What did the Bible say? He was angry with them. Why was he angry with them? Because he's petty and small and because he always wants to get his way? No, he was angry because they were, they were frustrating themselves foolishly, doubting him, not trusting him, robbing him of the joy of seeing them blessed. God is already blessed. You know what gives him great joy? Not when he's more blessed, but when you're more blessed. When you get saved, when you get right, when you go in. That's what he's looking for. He's already in. He lacks nothing. He doesn't need you. He loves you. Therefore, he wants to see you blessed. If you have children or loved ones and you are trying to help them to get blessed and they won't do it, you're not angry with them because you hate them. You're angry with them because you love them and you want to see them blessed. That's why you're fired up. So here we go. Take a deep breath now. The Bible says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh and died for us, arm yourselves like warriors with the same purpose being willing to suffer for doing what is right and pleasing God. Because whoever has suffered in the flesh, being like-minded with Christ, is done with intentional sin, having stopped pleasing the world, so that he can no longer spend the rest of his natural life living for human appetites and desires, but lives for the will and purpose of God. For the time already passed is more than enough for doing what the unsaved Gentiles like to do living unrestrained as you have done in a course of shameless sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and wanton idolatry. In connection with all this, they, the unbelievers, are resentful and surprised that you do not think like them, value their values, and run hand in hand with them into the same excesses of dissipation and immoral freedom. And they criticize and abuse and ridicule you and make fun of your values, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge and pass sentence on the living and the dead. You know what the suffering in the flesh is? It's not suffering for our sins. It's the suffering that your flesh is put through when you tell it no. When you say no to your flesh, 
and you say yes to God, your flesh will be in intense pain. You will experience pain like you've never experienced before. It will hurt so bad. Your flesh will make it hurt. Your flesh will try to make you pay. Think about a spoiled little child and the suffering that a parent goes through when they tell that spoiled little child no. Think of the pouting. Think of the tantrums. Think of the words that are said, I hate you, mommy. I hate you. Think of it now. So what do we do when we hear that? Do we do what some parents do? Do we just say, oh, I can't stand that. Oh, I just, I just want peace. See, there, there is no peace, is there? Never going to be peace. I just want some peace. Oh, I'm just so tired. I just don't have time to deal with this. Oh, I just want to, I just want to, Okay, oh, just here, just take it and shut up. So we give our flesh what it wants so that it will be quiet. But it will only be quiet for now. It will only be quiet until it lays eyes on something else that it wants. And then the tantrums will start again. And the pouting and the name calling. And there'll be no peace. And there'll be no peace. When you try to compromise with the flesh, You'll, you'll stay in the wilderness. You'll never have rest. You'll never have peace. You'll never do right. You'll never go in. You're going to suffer. When you stop doing something, when you cancel something, or you quit going somewhere, your flesh is going to scream. And your flesh is going to direct its attacks at everything that it lays its eyes on. Don't listen to that preacher. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a legalist. He's an old man. He's a, he's a, you, you, the ad hominem arguments. You know, when you don't have a leg to stand on, you just attack the person. When you don't have anything that you can say that makes any sense, that's true, you just haul off and slug the guy. So that's what you're going to do. Some of you are going to do that. You're going to say, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, he's not the boss of me. I'm, I don't have to, I can do what I want. There's no harm in that. There's no problem with this. You think you guys can stand a series like this? Because this is a series now. Are you ready for this? I'm warning you. Because we're not just going to get into this like this. I'm off to a good start. But I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. Just off to a good start now. You're going to get a break next week. Maybe. But probably not. Because if you don't know Lisa Bevere, then you're probably not going to get a break but at least it'll be somebody different. <laughs> so let me ask you this as we get ready to wrap it up. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but just, just I'm asking the question, how many of you in your hearts are saying, no longer? What did, what did, what did, the, what did Peter say? He said that so that they should no longer, no longer, no longer live the rest of their lives for the flesh. There, there, there's a cry in some of your hearts that just says, I don't want to live like this any longer. I just, you know, to use bad grammar, I don't want to, I don't want to be like this no longer. No longer, Lord, no longer. I don't want to stretch this out. I don't want to drag this out another day. I don't want to drag this out another year. I mean, this has been dragging on and on. I just... Isn't there a point, some kind of a point somewhere where this can stop? Where I don't have to be in the wilderness anymore? Because I hate it here. I hate it here, but I'm scared to go in. I don't have faith to go in. I mean, I, getting saved was easy. Going in seems Im, almost impossible. It seems like, do we really have to do that? I mean, does God really expect us to, to cross the Jordan too? I mean, after we've walk through the Red Sea and all this stuff? I mean, can't God just do it? Why do I have to face those giants? Why do I have to go in? I don't want to go in. Can't God just beam me up? Why do I have to walk up the steps to the second floor? Can't I take an elevator? Can't somebody carry me? No. No, that's not going to happen. 
But the cry of your heart is, or I, no longer. And you're just saying in your heart, I want out of this wilderness. And I want it so bad that I'm ready to face the giants and submit to God. And I'm ready to cross over. That's how bad I want it. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to start. I'm ready to start. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting started. I'm just taking a step. That's all I can do. But I'm, I'm, I'm done wandering around in the wilderness. Now I'm going to turn and face God in faith. And I'm going to trust him to help me face these giants. And Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. And they said, we're well able to take these giants out. Because God's going to fight for us. Because God promised us that we would go in. God promised you that you wouldn't just come out, but you'd go in. And going into the promised land, heaven is not the promised land. Heaven is not the promised land. If heaven was the promised land, as soon as he brought them out, he would have taken them all to heaven. But he didn't take them all to heaven, did he? He didn't. He said, now you're going to walk in faith. And I want you to demonstrate now, I've demonstrated my power unilaterally on Pharaoh. You didn't do anything. I did it all. Now I want to demonstrate my power in you because you're going to go in there and you are going to fight and face and defeat these giants. And everyone's going to watch you do it. They're going to see you do it. They're going to see that God is real. God is real. And he works in men's hearts and he changes them and takes them from being slaves to being champions. And God gets the glory when that happens. Hallelujah. So here's what the scripture says, beloved friends. What should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. You know, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. That's our response. So what is the first step that will lead you in the direction of what God has promised? Holiness, victory, amen, peace, joy, right living. What is the first step? Is to present yourself to the Lord. and Say, Lord, here I am. I'm reporting to you today that you might take me in and I'm headed in that direction. I'm not wandering anymore. I'm not living in the wilderness. I'm not one and done. I am no way done. I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. Coming out of bondage, coming out of slavery, getting saved, being born again. That was the, that was the beginning. But now I'm going in. I'm going in to all the fullness that God has promised to those who believe. Amen? Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, now we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for moving in the hearts of the people today, moving in all of our hearts, dealing with us in, in love and mercy and grace and truth. So we give you the praise for that. Lord, let faith arise. Let those that have been afraid and let those that have been intimidated by the giants in their life, let them begin to see them from God's perspective. Let those that are thinking like a grasshopper, thinking that they're so small and so weak that they'll just have to stay in the wilderness for the rest of their lives until they die. And then that will be the thing that will deliver them. And that will be the thing that will bring them in to what God has promised. Lord, let their minds be changed by the power of God now in Jesus' name. Let those that have that cry in their heart where they just simply are saying, Lord, no longer. I'm not, I just no. I'm not doing this any longer. I'm going to take a step of faith today. I'm going to believe that you're going to empower me to go in. I'm going in. If that's you today, I want you to rise up out of your seat and just come. Let's all stand to our feet once again. And I want you to make room for those that are coming. And I want you to come. I want you to take that first step of faith. Present yourself to the Lord. I'm going to pray for you. But you're taking that first step and saying, Lord, I've, I've been in a wilderness experience. And I've been in it for years. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know anything about this. I didn't even know that he brought me out to bring me in. I never heard that. I just thought I was, I got, I got saved. My sins are forgiven. I got my ticket to heaven. What else is there? Well, there's so much more. There's the whole promised land of going in to all that God has for us. So I just want you to come. Yeah, you can just come and step right up close. 
Yeah, you can just come right up here. You can stand right up close where I can see you. I want to go in. I'm ready to come in. You may be up in the balcony. Aren't you to come? We'll just wait for you. You can take the steps down and we'll, we'll wait for you. Lord, I don't want to live like this any longer. I don't want to live with all this stuff any longer. I don't want my flesh to rule in my life anymore. I want to be free and I want to go in. I want to go into a new Christian life. I don't want to go into some new experiences with God. I want to know what God's power really tastes like and really feels like. Some of you may not be saved. You've never even taken that first step. So you're still in sin. And you've never trusted the Lord to bring you out and put your faith and trust in Christ to bring you out. And if that's you, then I want to encourage you to come as well. Just saying, Lord, I, I put my trust in Christ. I put my trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross. And I realize today that I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a good person. I'm not righteous in my own righteousness, that I can't trust in what I can do to be good, to somehow satisfy God's holy requirements. But Jesus has done it all for me on the cross. And I want to put my trust in him and I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. Maybe somebody's been witnessing to you and talking to you about the plan of salvation, God's plan for you to be born again, how you can be saved. You've heard that. You've heard it maybe recently, maybe in the past. Somebody explained it to you. And now this morning, that's just really coming alive. And you want to take that step of faith to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior and publicly confess him as your Lord and Savior. We want to give you a chance to do that as well. And so you come wherever you are, the balcony, throughout the room. Anyone? You're not born again. You want to be born again? You receive Christ? Some, some of you may be thinking, well, he's talking about people that are backsliders. I'm not talking about people that are backsliders. I'm talking about people that are living in the wilderness. Sometimes a backslider is not someone who's so obvious. Sometimes a backslider is a person who's still attending church. They're still doing all these things, but they, they've never had the faith to cross over. They're just living in religion, never had the faith to cross over. So this is not about some sin that you did last week and now you're coming to repent of it. You just stumbled and fell and did something and now you feel convicted. This is, this is, about, this is about moving forward in God. Amen? It's not about taking care of some little thing that, you know, you're troubled by. It's about a whole different way of thinking and a completely new direction for life where you're moving somewhere, you're going somewhere, and you weren't before, and you didn't want to, and you were afraid to. Now you realize, I have to. I have to. He brought me out. I can't stay here in the wilderness. I have to go in. I can't let that opportunity pass me by. There were people who said no. Maybe some of you are just saying flat out, no, no. I'm not ready to do that. I'm not ready to do that. If you're not ready today, we pray that you'll get ready soon. That God will give you another opportunity. But I wouldn't play around with that if I were you. If today you hear his voice. Isn't that what the Bible says? Don't harden your heart. Don't stiffen your neck. Don't be like those people who came out but never went in. So I'm going to pray for you, okay? Now, if you're here to give your heart to Christ and you've never done that before, and some of you may be in that position, you've never given your life to Jesus, and after the service is over, we want to talk to you because if, if God's bringing you out, then we want to come alongside you and walk with you so that you can go in. Amen? Because you're not, just, you're not just coming out. You're coming out to go in. So to go in, you need some people that will come alongside you who are doing that themselves. They also are going in. They're not all, they're not all the way there yet. They haven't reached the, 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 final, the final destination. But they're headed in that direction. And, and we, we want to help you get there. Amen? Because you can't get there by yourself. All right? So this is this, just the start. So after the service is over... Uh, Odell Benton right there. Just turn and look at him. See him? There he is. That's Odell Benton. He's going to talk to you. He'll give you some literature and, and uh, he'll give you the encouragement that you need. So I want all of us to pray. Let's pray this together. 
just to say, Lord Jesus, I present myself completely to you as a living sacrifice. Thank you for bringing me out. And now I commit myself to you for the purpose of going in, drawing near to you, walking with you, surrendering all to you, allowing you to cleanse me, to purify me, willing to face whatever pain the flesh puts on me until it dies and joy comes and peace comes and righteousness is revealed. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for touching me now, receiving me now, setting my heart on fire. I am a living sacrifice. I am out and I am going in, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.